Hi, and welcome to Red Reviews, a podcast where we cover a variety of books from a Marxist and anarchist perspective. And I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me, Justin. Thanks, Corey. It's good to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are things good. over on your se- your end? Not too, excuse me, not too bad. Um, the weather's been pretty nice here um, so far, a little on the humid side, but can't complain. Um, It'll certainly get much hotter as the summer goes. Yeah, but we're off to a better start this spring than we were last. Than we were last spring. Last spring was all of those horrible wildfires, right? Um, and so there was like a haze through much of the spring <laughs> summer. So fortunately, that's not really here right now. Thank goodness. Knock on yeah. wood. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. But um, but yeah, no, it's been nice. It's been it's been quite nice and um. Yeah, it's uh, just staying busy. Can't believe we're almost into June, which is like wild. Um, yeah, no kidding. But uh, but yeah. So um, so yeah. Uh, do we have anybody joining us so far? We got uh, some random geek is here. So hello, hello. On, Thank you uh, so much. Over on the Twitch, uh, we got a couple other viewers, but nobody's commented. So okay, great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Feel free to drop your questions or comments in the chat, and we'll respond to them in, during the show as best we can. Um, so tonight um, is, uh, I think, uh, going to be an hour-long manifestation of me and a little bit of humble pie, because I think for a long time, I've been fairly critical of the whole like degrowth concept. Right. Um, and we've talked about it on the show. I've read a lot of people who've been critical of it, people like Lee Phillips and the, the Left Reckoning guys um, and Matt Huber. Um, and I've re- but since that, I've, I've read a couple books on it. Um, one I didn't really like very much, which was The Future is Degrowth, which was kind of a boring, slightly academic book that wasn't particularly fun to read and didn't really provide me with anything insightful, to be honest. Okay. Didn't provide like a moral case for why we should have a more of a degrowth mindset. But the other book that I read was the complete opposite. I loved it. And I think that, well, I may not necessarily call myself a degrowther. I think that if this is the idea of degrowth that we're going forward with, I think I can call a co-sign on it enthusiastically. Um, so tonight, the book we're discussing is um, Less is More by Jason Hickel. Nice. Um, how degrowth will save the world. Um, and I'll read his little bio here. So he was an econ- he's an economic anthropologist, um, and he uh, is a Fulbright scholar and fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He was originally he's originally from Eswatini or Swaziland, which is near South Africa, um, and spent a number of years with migrant workers in South Africa, writing about exploitation and political resistance in the wake of apartheid. Um, he regularly writes for the Guardian. Um, and is, serves as an advisor for the Green New Deal for Europe and sits on the Lansing Commission for Operations and Redistributive Justice. Um, so he's a very interesting guy, and he comes with a, a really interesting background where growing up in Eswatini, he's growing up in a country with a lot of beautiful, teeming wildlife, and that's kind of how the book right. starts. Okay. And he talks about growing up in in this wonderful environment with all these different beautiful animals and, and insects and and trees and plants and sort of laments how we've gotten into the state that we've gotten in as a as a, as a world mm-hmm. where you know we are truly in a climate crisis. I, I think that that's I think without question. Yeah. I think that um, we are on track to perhaps get over that. 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold by 2030. It looks like we're, we're probably going to blow right past that. Yep. So now we're going to be in a position where we're going to have to start thinking very critically about how society moves forward. Yeah. And what he tries to make the argument of is that the real problem is not even is not um, is not always just distribution of wealth, although that's a part of it. And he's written about that a lot in another book that he's written on. He's written about. Um, about inequality and the problems of inequality and how we should address it. But the other problem is really, truly the idea of growth, Mm -hmm. the growthism as a concept and capitalism requires growth. You can't just have like a steady economy where every year you kind of maybe either break even or eke out a minor profit, right? In capitalism, you can't do that. You have to constantly grow and grow and grow and grow. 
Yeah. But in order to grow, you have to like use more resources, more fuel, more materials, right? More land. Um, and with all of that comes more and more what economists call externalities or harms to the environment, to the global commons. And the other issue with growthism is the distribution of wealth under the system that we live in, which is disproportionately for the global north, who account yeah. for the vast majority of resource use and emissions. Um, versus the global south, where most of the materials come from and where the most egregious effects of the climate crisis will be felt. Yeah. yeah. And as a result, we are in a place where we can really no longer continue doing what we're doing. Um, and this is where we kind of get into the question of what exactly degrowth is and kind of where degrowth comes out of. Um, so... Generally, I've always kind of thought that in the sort of debate on environmental issues, most people on, in this discussion often fall into two camps. The first are the Malthusians. Um, mm -hmm. And they're named that because of Thomas Robert Malthus, who was a cleric and economist who wrote an essay on population growth, where he argued that at some point um, the population would grow exponentially and food production would be linear, and there would be a point where there would not be enough food for all the people who are here, and um, we could not handle a certain level of population, and that people would 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 need to uh, population would need to be lessened in order to um, find some equilibrium between population and food or resource use. Right. Um, this is why Malthus argued against um, any kind of protections for the poor. Or the disabled, or or um, the indigent, um, and as a result, uh, a lot of the poor laws that had been in existence in Britain were repealed. Um, a lot of them were repealed during um, the growth of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so Malthusians are people who basically argue that the environment has hard limits, and mm -hmm. if we do not respect those hard limits, we will um, we will face consequences for surpassing those limits. So the people who are often on the Malthusian side are people like Paul Ehrlich, who wrote the population bomb in the 1960s, which is this deeply racist, disgusting tract. He, he, he went to India and he saw a bunch of people in India and it freaked him the fuck out. <laughs> and he saw all these brown people like, you know, pissing on the street or trying to get by and it just freaked him the fuck out. He's like, yeah. OK, we have to start putting sterilization material in the water, like, Jeez, like which is one of the proposals he had. This also has the the um, the limits to growth, which is a report that was published in the 1970s, um, which Jason Hickel talks about in the book. And um, you you get uh, in terms of politics, this is where you know um, the politics of limits is austerity, right? That that, right. that um, you have to tighten our belts. We can't have as much. We have to cut back. Blah blah blah. blah. And what's interesting in the discussion on austerity is it's never the rich people who have to ever tighten their belts or or give a little bit more or sacrifice they're never the ones that have to it's always the poor it's always yeah. the middle classes it's always the um people who are the, already under the thumb of the <laughs> of the system right yeah. people who are already facing the egregious effects of imperialism or in colonialism yeah um so that's kind of what Malthusians are, right? And there are those on the sort of what you would call the, maybe the liberal left who are Malthusians. Bill McKibben's a good example of this, right. where he's somebody who has written extensively about how, um, you know, we just can't do what we need to do. What we, we, we cannot continue to uh, use resources and materials in the way that we are. And we have to drastically curtail our lives back. Um, and there's always yeah. like a there's always like this predetermined time that they, we think we should we always go back to. So for some people it's like the 1970s, and for some people it's like the 1830s, which is I think what Bill McKibben's is, right. which is interesting when you think about America in the 1830s. No oh, shit, yeah. You know, just fill in the blanks there. <laughs> yeah. Um. And uh. Yeah. And so, or you know, or going back even further to like sort of like even you know pre agricultural time. Yeah, it's 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 funny to think like because it's always like the people who complain about like overpopulation or mass consumption with ever uh, without ever actually addressing like the systemic causes of that stuff or, exactly. or the, uh, you know the systems effect on people and you know uh, consumption. 
I agree. And I, and I would add to that, that they don't consider the distribution of that consumption. Right, right. That, um, and I think this is a criticism of degrowth is that it's trying to sell austerity politics in a different way. Mm. I think that can be the case if it's done incorrectly. I think if it's, if degrowth is argued for in the way that Jason Hickel's arguing for it, I think it would work because right. it's, it's a polit it's, it's a political vision of hope. Um, and the real degrowth is, is basically stop growth. And the way to get there is stop creating unnecessary bullshit in the economy. Stop having private jets. Stop having gross inequalities of wealth. Stop having people constantly eat beef all the time. Stop. Like there's certain things that would be just pretty easy for the human race to stop doing. Yeah. And we'd be okay. Up, without giving up all things. There's yeah. some things that could be easily given up by the few who have them the most. One interesting statistic he has in the book is that 60% of all agricultural land in the world is dedicated to cattle. Woof. Yeah, which is that's wild. Too much. <laughs> that's too Considering much. Considering that global beef <laughs> consumption is only 2%. Oof. Right. So we use 60% of agricultural land to produce 2% of food. Madness. Absolutely yeah. madness. No, that's, um, that's unsustainable. That is unsustainable. <laughs> um, and so on the other side of the debate, in this sort of environmental debate, so we have the Malthusians. On the other side of the debate are the Cornucopians. Okay. These are the people who are um, basically who argue that um, the problem of the environment is not so much everything that we consume. It's more a problem of growth, development, and equality, and that we, if we invest in science and technology, we'll create the technologies to help mitigate the effects of the climate crisis as best we can, and that we can create a tremendous amount of abundance for all. That, okay. um, that, that we don't actually have to, that in order to get to the future that we want, we don't need to consume less, we need to consume more, we just need to consume it differently. Um, and so people who are on this side of the bay widely vary in the political spectrum. So like people who are more in like the center or the right would be people like um, Julian Simon, the late economist who was very influential on another person that's sort of on the um, cornucopian debate. And that's Bjorn Lomborg, oh, yeah. um, the skeptical environmentalist. Yeah. Um, people like Mel Michael Schellenberger um, and others are kind of a part of the cornucopians who argue for the kind of position that with science and technology and ingenuity and innovation, we can get to the future that we want. Um, on the left, those are people like um, Lee Phillips, I think is probably kind of falls more into that camp. Okay. Degrowth, at least the way that Jason Hickel argues it, kind of breaks this binary, right. which I think is very helpful because yeah. for a long time, I was sort of wedded to that binary. And I've realized that it is really a false one that there are some good arguments to be made for limits and there's good arguments to be made for creating abundance. Mm -hmm. The issue is not necessarily abundance in and of itself. The problem is, is a economic system which prides growth and not abundance. Yeah. Because capitalism requires artificial scarcities in order to survive. So you create all these abundances, but then you, but, but then you put them behind gates and say, you can't have them. <laughs> yeah. So what, so what is degrowth, or at least what is it to Hickel? He has a definition of it towards the later part of the book, but I think it's good to start with, which is he says, sure. degrowth is not about reducing GDP, which is gross domestic product, which is sort of a economic indicator of all of the goods and services produced in a given region. It is about reducing the material and energy throughput of the economy to bring it back into balance with the living world while distributing income and resources more fairly liberating people from needless work, and investing the public goods that people need to thrive. I think that's a good definition of it. And I think it's yeah. one that works. Um, and there are ways that we can, that we see in history, where some of this was kind of done. So he sort of starts the book with capitalism's origin story. Um, okay. Uh, which, you know, Marx describes in Capital as, you know, blood dripping from every pore. He's sort of describing the very, because people assume that capitalism sort of evolved very sort of naturally and gradually over time. And that's not really the case. Like it mm -hmm. did in some respects, but a lot of times it was these very violent changes that were developed that actually brought capitalism into being as we understand it. Okay. So if we go back to the 14th and the 15th centuries, 
we see peasant revolts in record numbers all across Europe. Um, and they lead to um, an expansion of rights for the peasantry. Like the, and it's the, the in, a, in a lot of ways, it was the establishment of what we know of as the common system. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Lands were held in common, goods were held in common, and so on. When people say on the internet that like people in the Middle Ages worked less than than the average American does, like that's technically true. Yeah. Um there were there were a lot of many holidays and festivals that were built into people who lived in the middle medieval period. Um again, I'm not saying that their life was better than ours. In some respects it was probably worse, right? People died of very easily communicable diseases, they died of diseases of the teeth, they, they violence, whatever. Yeah. But there was one thing that they did do right, which was that they held goods in common and they were protected in the commons. Um, yeah. And two, that they had a lot more leisure time than most uh, people in the industrialized world have. Yeah. Which is very interesting. Capitalism, as it was developing, had to end all of that. And so the way that they did that was through the enclosure movement, where it was the destruction of the commons. Yeah. And, um, and so they destroyed the lands held in common. They ripped the peasantry from their way of life. And either required them to um, continue on the farms in industrial production or in sort of traditional agricultural production, or they go into the towns and start an industrial production. So you see floods of people leaving the countryside to the cities. Um, and so in Europe, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, you're in the, you know, in the development of capitalism, especially in Britain, you see a lot of poverty, pestilence, violence. Yeah. All this is brought about because of an economic system that prides growth above all else and the philosophy of growth. And it's, it's really built upon the idea that of the concepts really of dominion. So instead of our traditional notions of how humans related to nature was known as animism which was that we were one of many creatures on earth and that we were interrelated with, with nature, that we weren't separate from it. We were connected to it and it was connected to us. And it was, everything was interrelated. Starting really in the modern period, and it's no coincidence that it's also at the rise of capitalism, right? This is classic Marxism. This is classic historical materialism here, right? That the economic, the sort of means of production, the material forces shape the ideology of the time. Yeah. And so you get to philosophical leaders like Descartes and Descartes, who um, was a very influential philosopher in the, you know, the cognito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, that kind of stuff. But yeah. the thing he was very important in was this idea of the separateness of nature, this dominion theory of nature, which, of course, people can get from the Bible, too. <laughs> um, and so you have this separation and domination of nature rather than being as a part of it. And this sets up really the trouble of, with all of this growth, right? There's a lot of abundance, but that abundance is distributed quite poorly. And this is part of capitalism is in order to continue that growth, you have to create artificial scarcities. Because if you just let everybody kind of have abundance, then everybody has their needs met. Yeah. And then there's no imperative for growth and capitalism collapses on itself. Yeah. Um, it's so, cause that's where very much capitalism is very much like a cancer. It has to continually grow, but in growing, it actually kills the host. And in the sense of capitalism, it's kind of true that like in order to continually grow and be the system that it is, it's kind of a cancer on the earth. And at some point it's going to kill the earth, right? Yeah. Maybe not yeah. all of it, it, but it would kill a living planet, a habitable planet for humans and for certainly for other creatures, right? Um, because people argue that we're like in the sixth, the mass extinction. So why are we in this position? Because growthism is built into the structural nature of capitalism. Capitalism cannot survive without growth. Yeah, they literally, like, they just cannot say, well, this is where we're fine making this level of profit, so we'll just maintain it. It always has to be going up. Yes. And that's for a variety of reasons. Part of that's competition, that, you know, there will be someone out there who would try to get that growth. 
at the expense of other companies. Yeah. Part of it is what we learned from Marx, which is the decline of profit over time, that firms yeah. over time just stop making more money. Um, so they have to kind of find new and new ways to grow and new and new ways to extract profits. This is how you get colonialism um, and imperialism is that once the sort of the, ex- the resources are exhausted in a given region, you have to sort of go out. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Right. And if you look at the colonial um, adventures, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, the colonial ventures of Europe in, say, you know, the 1400s, 1500s, you know, in that period with Columbus and, and others, they're looking for new economic growth. They're looking for a way to grow the economy by extracting more and more resources and more and more surplus value from the world around them. And this creates a, an incredibly unequal distribution where those who are often the, the, the victims of that colonialism, in the case of, of you know, the New World, in the case of the United States or the North America, the Americas in general, it's at the expense of the indigenous peoples, right? Um, and in, say, Africa, it's going to be at the expense of Africans and the native Africans, not just those who are still in Africa in terms of that unequal colonial relationship in the 19th century, but obviously centuries before with the form of slavery. And slavery is sort of another form of enclosure of a commons, right? Humanity is held in common. And slavery is like a form of enclosure where these people don't get to be free, even though if in in a state of common law, everybody would sort of be free, freely, free laborers, right? You enclose them as slaves. Um, And you could say industrial capitalism does the same thing to workers, right? It's in it's enclosing them in wage labor, which is a form of slavery in and of itself. Yeah. And, um, and so we have a problem where it's not just linear growth, where it's like, it's not like one, two, three, four, five, where it just kind of goes up linearly. It's compound growth, where it's like one, you know, and then it's three, and then it's nine, and then it's uh, 64, and then it's, and then, you, you know, and it, yeah. it's, or whatever. And it grows more and more and more, so much so that by the time that you get to a certain level at 3% compound growth, it's 2,000% by the time you get 100 years later. And are we going to be using 2000% of the world's resources or 2000% of the world's energy? Like it's, it's kind of an insane way of looking at the world and it's unsustainable by its very conception. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and basically he describes this, um, as in capitalism, it's sort of private riches go up and public wealth goes down. It's known as the Lauderdale paradox, which is named after James Maitland, the eighth Earl of Lauderdale, who came up with the idea. Which is that if you really do look at it as private riches do go up in a society, that's less and less money dedicated to public works, public commons, like parks, libraries, healthcare, yep. you know, childcare, whatever it is. These are services that are no longer receiving the, the necessary resources because they have to go into private growth, growth yeah. and private gain. And it's a, a real disaster. And it gets even worse once you start factoring in the concept of GDP. And at that moment, at that, I'll take a break, and if we have comments, we can uh, address those for a sec. Yeah, so uh, I guess uh, we got a couple further back. Uh, some random geek said uh, degrowth is something I want to learn more about. Uh, Andrew of the YouTube channel Andrewism, uh, and previous guest of the show, has a video on degrowth. Oh, cool, cool. I'll have to check that out, too. And also, uh, yeah, the company that some random geek works at, uh, says he says, uh, Mike, my company is owned by a financial institution that wants increasing profits every year. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Nonsequently is here. Hello, so, hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us. And Velkin999 is also here. And they said, uh, you are not allowed to collect rainwater because we need to be able to charge you for it. Yes. This is a good example of that. Enclosures. Yeah. It's, it's a way of putting a paywall on something that wouldn't really have one. Yeah. Good point. And then our most recent one is uh, some random geek again. This is why I ask capitalists, can the earth grow 3% each year? Then why do you expect your company or the nation to grow for, from 3% each year? Exactly. Yeah. It's a very limited way of conceiving of what an economy is and how it functions. Yeah. Um, and we'll get into that when we start talking about GDP. Yeah, and I, I think that's pretty much all we need to bring up okay. in comments. So, so 
This all kind of gets supercharged with the idea of GDP or gross domestic product, also referred to sometimes as gross national product or GNB. Um, gross domestic product, as I mentioned earlier, is essentially a, a total, the sum total of all goods and services produced by a particular region in a given year. Okay. Um, so often that's defined as a country or a sequence of countries. So like there's the OECD countries, um, the organization of, of like the exporting countries or OECD countries. There's also um, the European Union, like the EU. There's the Commonwealth nations, which are like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, right? They're a part of this section. You could kind of lump those together. Um, North America, so you'd have Canada, the United States, and Mexico, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, OAS, the organization, or yeah, of American states. Um, so there are very different ways you can measure GDP. It's often done on a national level. Um, and as he writes um, in, in his book, he says, GDP growth is ultimately an indicator of the welfare of capitalism. That we have all come to see it as a proxy for the welfare of human beings represents, or humans represents an extraordinary ideological coup, which yeah. is true. Yeah. Where did GDP come from? It's kind of talked about as if it's like natural, like it's the moon and the tides. It's like, no, no, no. GDP is something that's not even really 100 years old. Right. Um, so GDP comes out of the 1930s. During the Great Depression, the, the U.S. federal government wanted a way to be able to measure economic activity to try to figure out how well the country was doing in the midst of the Great Depression. And the, and the model of gross domestic product was, was invented by a guy named Simon Kuznets, who himself like laid out very clearly, like, this is one way of looking at an economy. It's only one way. There yeah. are many different ways to look at it, but here's one that's kind of quantitative. It's not qualitative, but it's quantitative. And that just shows you, you the, the, the raw numbers. But instead of it sort of being one of many ways that we conceive of, a, of an economy, it became kind of the be all end all. And so mm -hmm. people started to make the argument that GDP growth leads to, like, say, higher life expectancy. This is an argument that you'll often hear from people like Steven Pinker or Bill Gates, Yeah, which is not true. Um, one thing that's fascinating is that if you look at, um, <laughs> if you really look at the growth of um, GDP over time, one thing you realize right away is that um, one of the with Britain especially, um, what actually lowered infant mortality and raised life expectancy in Britain was the development of sewers and toilets yeah. and public plumbing. Yeah, that was the Makes, stuff and yeah. public sanitation. Those were the things that actually raised people's life expectancy and lowered infant mortality. Now, someone could make the argument, if they're a smart ass, they could make the argument that, well, the GDP growth allowed them to have the wealth in a society to do all that public goods. Right. But it's like, that's not really a good way of thinking about it because GDP doesn't understand if it's public dollars or private dollars. Doesn't, it's, it's, there's not a real distinction between the two. Right. Yeah. So it's not really a good measure of it anyway. So public works doesn't necessarily equate to a GDP thing. Bingo, because it just so like, let's say there was 3% the growth in the and the sort of, I don't know, um, in the, the, the PVC pipe industry. Well, that was because there were government contracts, they're putting PVC pipe in the cities, right? Yeah. And, and then we can get the whole thing about taxes and that like, you know, we can talk about like, uh, modern monetary theory, which we've done on the show and talk about how like taxes really don't, you're not paying for things. It's, it's, a, it's a whole, it's a whole mess. But anyway, Long story short, one thing that's other, also interesting is that countries that often have a lower GDP do have higher life expectancies um, mm -hmm. and have a higher quality of life. So a good example of this is Japan. Japan has a, a, a smaller GDP than the United States, um, but has a, longer, a, a higher life expectancy. People live longer in Japan. And that's not just wealthy countries. Even people who, that would consider poor countries often have good indicators of life. Um, Costa Rica is an example of this. Um, where uh, a lot of times the reason why there's a lot of good um, uh, life expectancy or better rates of, of quality of life in a place like Costa Rica is, one, you have very strong local communities that are taking care of each other, and two, that um, they're often eating better diets, they're often not um, being fed all of the crap we eat in North America, so on and so forth. Yeah. But the other component of it, too, is so you have poor countries that have a lower GDP, who have higher life expectancy than Americans or 
Brits or whatever. But then you also have compared the United States and or, and or Canada or Mexico to like Europe, right? Well, Europe tends to have a higher life expectancy. Well, why is that? It's not necessarily because of GDP growth. Right. It's likely because of the universal healthcare systems that they have. Um, so I, like, I, I would imagine my hunch, I don't know this for true, for sure, but I would imagine Canada has a higher life expectancy than the United States. I would guess so, yeah. Um, mainly just because of the fact that we do, that you guys have a universal public health care system in yeah. a way that the United States just does not. Um, and so when you, when you get to that place, um, it, it just really underscores how um, that GDP growth is really only an indicator of capitalism, as he says. It's not an indicator of whether people are happier. So people have thought about, well, what if we had alternatives to, say, like GDP? Um, and one of the things that you could do is something like um, the genuine progress indicator or the index of sustainable economic welfare, both of which, as he says, set out to correct GDP for social and ecological costs. Because that's the thing. GDP doesn't um, GDP does not uh, a- account for environmental damage. So yeah, right. you might have 3% growth in say like the steel industry, but you have like a huge economic toll in the form of wastewater or waste um, or waste products that often go up rivers. So like, for example, in my home, my old hometown of Pocomo, there used to be a steel mill. Um, it was continental steel closed in the 1980s. They would often put their waste runoff into Wildcat Creek in Kokomo. Yeah. So for a long time, Wildcat Creek was fucking hazardous. No one want, no one would go into it. No one would want to go into it. It was, it, and, and, it, and it, it at one point even became a, an EPA or Environmental Protection Agency Superfund site, mm. which is when the federal government gives you an extra load of money to clean it up. Right. Because of the ravages of the steel mill. Um, this is the problem. And so when we think about it in this regard, we notice that a lot of these horrible things that often are a result of the gr- the GDP growth, this growth at all costs in this very small measure um, leads to real disaster. And, and it's not just with climate, although that's a huge component of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because a- as, um, as he writes, you know, in the book, by 2030, climate-related deaths are projected to reach up to 530,000 people a year. Jeez. Virtually all of these will happen in the global south. Rich countries will only suffer 1% of climate-related deaths within their borders. Yeah. And what's fascinating about this is the way that this is um, sort of carried out over time is that 40% of all historic global emissions come from the United States. Canada doesn't get off the hook completely, but you guys only have three, which is fascinating. That like <laughs> He puts North America together, United States is 40, and you guys are three. Which makes sense yeah. in, in, in that there's a large amount of your country that just isn't inhabited by people. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how many people live in Canada. What is it, like 30 million people? Yeah, roughly. R- okay, 30 million people. So our population is nearly triple or, or three times as large. It's three times no. as large as yours. So I mean, we're like, or, or 10 times ten or whatever. Times. Yeah, ten ten times. Times. It's 10 times because we're like 340 million people. See, I told you I'm not great at math. But it's it's... <laughs> We're a country of like 340 million people. It's much larger and our economic footprint is much larger as sort of the the core of the imperial core. And so these are real problems. Um, and I think that when they were sort of talking about these limits to growth in the 1970s, um, people ridiculed. Um, <laughs> when Jimmy Carter was president, he gave a speech in 1979 um, which is known now known as the Malays speech, but it was for him it was called the crisis of confidence speech, where he talks about how um, we've become a society that measures people not on what they do, but, but, but not by what one does, but by what one owns. And he kind of gives this sort of both energy policy speech slash like sermon, where he lays out like America is on a crash course here, and it's going to yeah. be bad. And what's really funny. Is that they didn't it, originally that speech went well with the public until the media turned on him. No, um, yeah. Because by this point, the media had already started to have their slobbering love affair with Ronald Reagan, despite the fact that he was about <laughs> bullshit. Um, but Reagan sold a very different message. 
where you know he would say things like there is no such thing as limits to growth because there's no such thing as limits to the human imagination like those, this kind of like lofty shit right and he wins the 1980 election in a landslide like politically like yeah. even mentioning the concept of limits is something that is seen as sort of a dead letter for most people yeah. which is a disaster i think because i i genuinely do believe that that um now having really read this book and studied degrowth more its goal is not to like have people like have less right the goal is for us to consume less overall but in balancing out things everybody kind of does better which i think is 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 contrary to what the narrative says mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think there's like a definitely a uh, uh like a a wastefulness to the capitalist system right because there's so much food there's so much stuff produced that just ends up in landfills or just ends up in a fucking you know compost or and in a lot of the cases it doesn't even end up in compost like it just ends up in a landfill weight rotting and being wasted so it's, absolutely yeah absolutely that's a great point and he actually mentions that in a later part of the book where he talks about how 50% of all the food that's produced in the world, um, which he says is equivalent to 2 billion tons, Oof. ends up wasted every year. Yeah. Now, one of the things that's very frustrating is that the vast majority of corn that's grown in the United States is not even for food. It's for fuel. They make it for ethanol. Yeah. Which is worse for the environment because not only is corn incredibly resource intensive to grow, it's a very thirsty crop. It's a very intense crop. Yeah. But two, ethanol's emissions are dog shit. Yeah. But this is like, a, they're crap compared to even gasoline. Gasoline is better for the environment than ethanol is. But under the Bush administration, they passed an energy act where a certain percentage of every gallon of gas sold in the United States had to have ethanol in it. Because biofuels. Yes. <laughs> and they think of it as biofuels. It's like, so we're, we're spending billions of dollars every year to grow corn that we don't need to create fuel that's not very good that we also don't need that actually adds to the carbon footprint yeah and makes gas more expensive yep what the hell are we doing here and it's i think a lot of bad thing <laughs> it's all, it seems like a bad thing but one interesting thing you mentioned like landfills right so in south korea um they banned food waste from their landfills so ah. you just can't you just can't Get rid of food waste like that. Um, but recycling is not a panacea. Um, you know, I think the problem no. with recycling is that paper and, I mean, plastics recycling is a complete farce. It, 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 it's never worked. Yeah. Paper recycling is not much better. It's much easier just to tear down brand new. It's actually better for the environment to grow trees for the specific purpose of paper, cut them down, make them into paper, yeah. than recycling paper. It's more, it's way more energy intensive. There are certain things that are good to recycle, like aluminum is a very good thing to recycle. It's cheaper to use recycled aluminum than it is to, to mine bauxite out of the ground and make new aluminum. And also, like, aluminum has a market value, like in the way that paper and plastic doesn't have. Right. A plastic water jug is, like, worth a fraction of a cent compared to um, a can, which could be, based on return back policy, could be a nickel or 10 cents or whatever. Um, and back in the day, that's how it was. And in some states in the country, I'm not sure what it's like in Canada, but in some states in the US, like you can return your cans and they'll give you money back for them. Or if you return your bottles back to, the, yeah. to them, you they'll pay your give deposit you like when you buy it and then you get your deposit back when you return it to the recycling yeah. facility. And a ton of people do that. That's why, you know, back in the day, you'd see people, you know, people who are on hard, hard, on hard times, like going through trash, trying to find aluminum cans or bottles because yeah. that's how they could make money. And, um, and so like recycling is not the be all end all. And I think that gets us into our broader discussion of talking about, um, like technology as being the savior, which I've always kind of been of, that's always been kind of my thing. I'm like, well, scientists are smart. They'll figure this out. We'll solve these problems. The, the issue is, is that that's kind of built upon, I think, a very false assumption. So one of the things that was really built into the Paris Climate Accord when it was originally conceived in order to get to that you know more than 1.5 degrees centigrade warming by 2030 that number was something called BECCS or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage which was created theoretically by an austrian academic named michael obersteiner 
Okay. And while it had never been proven like on the ground that this is what they could do, his modeling kind of took the world, the academic world and the climate world by storm because it was a kind of an easy way to sort of plug in this BECCS into any kind of climate modeling and they could go, oh, we'll get the targets that we need. Yeah. But the problem is, is that, um, as he mentions, it's B, BECCS is not, it's not viable for a couple of reasons. One, um, it's not been proven to be scalable. So as he mentions, uh, to make it work, it would require that we create a global carbon capture and storage system, a CCS system, capable of sucking up some 15 billion tons of CO2 a year. Currently, right now, we have capacity to handle about 0. 0.028 billion tons. Only a fraction of that is verified. So, the, I, I mean, that's insane to me. <laughs> I mean, I can't, that number is not even, I mean, so yeah. it's a technology that's never really been proven. They've never figured it out. It's not, it's built, it's been built in the climate models theoretically. But as we talked about in the post game, there's theory and there's practice. And those yeah. are two different things. And the other issue is that, um, in order to hit the BECCS targets that they've established under the Paris Climate Agreement, um, they would have to do a lot of environmental damage to get there in the form of biofuels, cutting down forests to create the areas for um, like wind and solar farms that we should still have. I'm not necessarily against wind and solar, but in order to hit the BECCS targets or the carbon capture technology targets, you would need a lot of land to do it. And so they yeah. would have to tear down forests or get rid of other vegetation. Um, and as he me mentions here, it would slash global forest cover by 10% and it would lead to an additional 7% loss in biodiversity. So the BECCS doesn't work. It's, 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 and when I read this, this, I mean, this hit me like a ton of bricks because yeah. I was under the assumption that BECCS, at least as I had read about it, was a real thing, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's basically something, it's a, we'll get to it. We're getting there, right? <laughs> it's a placeholder. The other issue and the other technology that they're trying to develop, and it's been really hot in the news lately because I think they're testing it now, which is terrifying in its own right, is um, aerosol injections into the air. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so Bill Gates is Geoengineering. Geoengineering, right? So the problem is with this is that According to Hickel, the existing climate models of the use of these aerosol injections that would go into the atmosphere and basically block the sun. Um, there's a couple issues with them. Primarily that, that sort of these, these, um, climate aerosols are very diffuse. Like they diffuse very quickly. They're mm. not, they don't tend to do the work that they need to do because they don't stay around long enough to make it work. Okay. Um, but the other issue is that, um, it could end up tearing holes in the ozone layer, which, of course, we're now in the process of healing after the banning of CFCs in the 1980s or yeah. uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Um, basically, the stuff that used to be in Aquanet and for refrigerators and air conditioners, Freon was really bad for you. It was bad for people. It was bad for the environment. And in the 1980s, we banned CFCs. And it's and, and we're on track to healing the, the global ozone layer, which is yeah. a key, key component of our environmental system. This aerosol... Uh, technology, which is completely unproven, um, could lead to these further problems. I mean, the real issue is why are we doing this? And somebody made a great point on social media where they said, you know, they will literally put chemicals in the air to block the sun before giving up any of their wealth and power. Yeah. And it's true. Yep. Um, and exactly what it is. The other problem with, with sort of Oh, we'll handle all this with technology is what's called Jevons paradox, or what we often refer to as, as um, induced demand. Mm. And the problem with that is growth continues even after efficiency gains, therefore wiping out any benefits. Yeah. yeah. So if we say we create a more efficient way of making a uh, like a pair of boots, that just means the capitalists will make more boots. It doesn't it's, mean they'll make less. Yeah, that's make, right. They'll make more boots and, and not fewer. Yeah, you know, let me, it's, you know, it's make, the traffic. You you widen the road, cars fill it up. You widen it again, bingo. cars fill it up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So this is really the trouble here, is that technology is not a panacea. It's not going to solve all of our problems. Yeah. Technology is a very crucial element. I'm not necessarily against the geoengineering, but the problem I have with it is, 
why are we making these decisions about what to do with it, with our atmosphere without any kind of democratic input? Which is, I think, the big problem. Yeah. Um, or, or to quote a, a very good podcast, tech won't save us. Tech will not save us. Um, <laughs> I love that podcast. I've been listening to it a lot. And I've also been listening to, um, this is a quick side note, um, Ed Zittrain, who's been a guest on that show. Okay. Um, who's, who's awesome. Um, I really like him. And um, he, uh, he has his own podcast called Better Offline, which is another really good deep dive into how most of Silicon Valley is completely and utterly full of shit. They are not above. We are in the, we are truly in the, we are divorcing any, our companies from any concept of reality now. Yeah. Um, where they don't actually provide a good or a service. Like, yeah, like Steve Jobs was an asshole, but it, like the, a phone is something you can use. Like it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a thing. Like I can pull it out. I can make calls. I can listen to music. I can text. Like I can do things with it. Right. What exactly can I do with AI? Like there's certain things you can do with it. Right. That's, that's the frustrating thing because they keep forcing us to look at it. And like, like, I just got a text message today from Google messages saying, here's Gemini, please use yes. us. And I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> that's their chat GBT clone. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah. no, no, get out we're of not, here. no. And it's not to say that there aren't ways that it could be used for tools. I mean, we use stuff like that for like our clipping for yeah, our show, right? right? Like, but that's pretty simple, right? It's just text to speech and it's creating, it's, you know, it's not that elaborate. It's no, yeah. but there's like, uh, like some of these things that you use for search product searches, they've replaced the search bar with an AI tool. Oh, I know. Instagram's like that now where they have like the meta AI. I don't know what the fuck. I don't want it. I want to search. I don't want it. I just want to search. I actually tried it the other day for something and it was completely and utterly useless to me. I was trying to look for yeah. a person in a specific city and it couldn't help me at all. Where back in the day, if you just typed in a name and a city, you'd often get users. Yep. That's it's right. It's just terrible. It's you're at making least I me could scroll through them to see who who I'm looking and for. And I could actually, yeah. So that's kind of the issue too. So um so yeah. Do we have any comments? Uh, yeah, make sure we some, random geek, uh, some random geek has had a couple here. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, aerosol, the stuff that poked a hole in the ozone layer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. They want to put, they want to put climate mitigating aerosols in the air. I, I mean, I don't think it's exactly the same as the CFCs that were used back in the eighties, but at the same time, it's a very unproven technology. Yeah. And I really, I mean, the ways that we can clean up the atmosphere don't require that kind of stuff. Like what we could do are things like um, tree planting programs. Um, there are some forms of carbon capture where you can um, do air filtering. Like there's this like, I think there's, it's like run by the U.S. government or something, but there's like this giant massive air filter somewhere out like Utah or something. Don't quote me on that. I read about it a while back. I could be full of crap. But anyway, it, it's, it's, um, you know, there's there's other things that you could do, um, yeah. which which of course also we could just not live under this economic system and change it and make it okay, better. That's got to be what we do. That's right? the bigger <laughs> thing, and that's and that's the kind of the broader point of his book, which is that like tech won't save us, individual choices won't save us. What really will save us is changing what the economy is. Yeah, fundamentally. Yeah, yeah and uh, some random geek also said. If we had a car that runs on water instead of gasoline, we would double the number of cars in the world. Yes. Exactly. That's right. That's why that's right. the electric car isn't like the panacea of this either, right? Yes. That's a really, really good point. Because, and we talked about that in our episode on, on Paris Marx's excellent book, yeah. where electric cars have all of the, a lot of the same problems that gasoline-powered cars do in terms of the extraction of the heavy elements and metals that go into the creation of those batteries and, and, and for the electric motors. But yeah. a lot of times this is, this is extraction from literal children labor or slave labor um, or people yeah. who are working in incredibly oppressive and dangerous conditions. Not to mention the fact that a lot of these um, raw materials, <clears throat> excuse me, come from the global South, right? So there's a power imbalance yep. where, you know, it's that whole thing of like, you know, we'll coup whoever we want, right? You know, Elon Musk's famous tweet about the Bolivian, the attempted Bolivian coup in 2019. Yeah. Um, and so a lot that's of the other problem uh, too. 
a lot of stuff that's going on in Congo can be related to uh, uh, the extraction of resources that we need for our tech in the in the global north. So, Absolutely. And like one of the, I think one of the other bigger problems with nuclear energy is the vast majority of the reserves uh, of the, the uh, radioactive materials that are used for nuclear energy in France come from Africa, sort of reinforcing that neo-colonial relationship. Yeah, um, that's right. So I think that's the other problem too. Uh, Vilkin 999 just said, at least electric cars can make cars exploding for no reason in movies make more sense going forward. This is a very good point. Yeah. This is a very solid point. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, just the fact that um, Tesla had to do a, 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 a complete and total recall of all of their Cybertrucks because the accelerator pedal didn't work. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that, um, and I highly recommend people go listen to one of their more recent episodes of Tech Won't Save Us with Ed, I think, Ed, Ned, Ed Niedermeyer, who was a journalist who covers Tesla where he lays out very, very clearly all of the problems with Tesla. That Tesla yeah. is essentially a paper tiger at this point. It's a lot of bark, not really any bite. The, it's, its stock price is in no relationship to how the actual company is doing or fun functioning. No. It's 100% um, hype, right? Like <laughs> it's all hype. It's all smoke and mirrors. That's why, um, you know, instead of... What's crazy is one of the only things about Tesla, the only thing, one of the few things about the Tesla business that was successful is the supercharger network that, that, so su the supercharger network where all other sort of EVs that are made in the US have sort of conformed to the supercharger standard. Now, like Tesla could have, you know, charged licensing fees from the auto companies to like do all of that. And they could have made money, but he didn't want to double down on that because it was like, well, that's not innovative enough. That's not sexy enough right. for the stock price. So he's doubling down in this whole um, uh, on the sort of the 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 auto taxis, you know, he, he, on the on the AI taxis. That's what he's really doubling down on. But the thing is, is like there's already companies doing the um, the sort of auto taxis better than Tesla does. Like there's right. one in San Francisco that actually works okay. much better than whatever. Um, uh, now, mind you, the reason it does is because it's only in San Francisco and it's trained its cars in, to yeah. in San Francisco rather than like longer trips. Right. And that's really the problem with uh, the auto taxis is that or the self-driving taxis is like people would want to do long trips. Um, they don't work for long trips. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there was some kind of device that would work for really <laughs> long trips. I don't I don't know. It would, maybe it would have a rail of some sort. I think it would. I think it might. It might. Um, and uh, it might have. It might have a. Whole, it might have a. Um, might have a whistle that goes woot woot. Um, it might, but uh, it might. might. It just might. Um, do we yeah. have any other comments? Uh, Elon. Uh, yeah. Some random geek says Elon Musk is perfect for Silicon Valley. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes, he is. Yeah. He's he's such a moron. It's kind of remarkable. Yeah. For sure. All marketing. It's all hype with that guy. And then um, uh, Vilkin999 said, tech bros want Blade Runner to be real so bad. Like, it's a good thing. The, I'm convinced. This is the other thing, too. So you're absolutely right. I agree with you 100%. And I'll add something to it. So where did that term metaverse come from, right? Now, metaverse, at least in literature, comes from Neil Stevenson. It comes from his book called Stow Crash, which is kind of a cyberpunk novel published in yeah. the early 90s. I've read it. It's a great book. It's not what you would want to base your society it's on. It's a dystopian, right? <laughs> it's a dystopian novel where states really aren't anything and the whole world is essentially controlled by corporations. And in order for you to go from one part of a city to another, what are called franchulets, like consulate and franchise kind of smashed together, sure. you have to have a passport to go everywhere you go. Um, and then they charge you like going from different places, whatever. But the metaverse itself was was something that was deeply ingrained in sort of this dystopian novel of Neil Stevenson's. I'm convinced these people have never read the book. I I'm convinced that they just sort of like the vibes and I've heard the term um, because Zuckerberg probably more so than, than Elon Musk. Elon Musk does not strike me as a reader. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think he's somebody who sits and actually reads books. Um, oh. He might read tweets. It seems like he likes to read tweets, but that's about it. Yeah, he might read a right. magazine. I don't know. But he seems like somebody who, who would think that wasting time on books 
was was a fool's errand that like yeah. what am i going to learn from books i feel like he's that kind of dipshit he doesn't even listen to audiobooks he listens to interviews of himself amazing <laughs> absolutely amazing <laughs> incredible <laughs> he truly is i mean he is truly like a he, he he may have been from south africa but in many ways he's american as apple pie um in terms of his narcissism and his yeah. hucksterism yeah for sure but yeah i just i'm convinced these people have really no idea that like you know snow crash is not like a, a, a manual for how to build a world like right like, you know neil stevenson goes to the book trying to explain the problems of like increased corporate control and the limit of government and, and limiting government and how it has an adverse effect on the public commons and it's all in the book. And it's like, cause the book is all about like gangsters and shit. Like I don't, more, I, <laughs> more and more, so I'm weird. convinced that satire or like political commentary or, or real world commentary through art never really hit home for most people. <laughs> like, it's always, no. they always miss the point. They, they think Tyler Durden is a hero in fight club. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> they know? think that, Democracy is a real thing, even when the author himself, who came up with the term, said it was parody. Yeah, um, yeah I think you're right. Part of it is because Americans are hyper literal. Yeah, um, Americans don't do very well with irony um, and and humor. We just don't. Um, Americans are hyper literal, um, and I yeah, say that as sure. one who, as a person who can often be hyper literal. Right. But um, but yeah, no, it. it I think these people are psychos and why we keep giving them power and money and control is beyond me. I mean, I can't believe that like, well, I can believe it, but I mean, I just, it's so frustrating that like the U S department of defense has, has siphoned off certain key contracts to someone like Elon Musk. So someone that volatile and that self-absorbed and so cut off from democratic input controls a lot of the infrastructure that goes into our defense it's yeah, it's really wild. dangerous because then he can say crazy things and the dod has to be like i don't know what we do now um <laughs> but uh yeah for sure he almost this is why like i hate jeff bezos but he's a lot more normal than these other guys in the sense that he's a very typical robber baron capitalist scumbag he's not he's not yeah. he's not weird in the way that like elon musk or zuckerberg are he's He's, he's just weird, an, but he's, he's not just an evil weird. oligarch. Like, he's the, yeah, <laughs> he's, he's he not kinda, a fascist necessarily. <laughs> yeah, he owns it in a way. He owns it. He, he owns his shittiness in a way that these guys don't. Don't. Yeah. And I and I. That's why I I don't respect that. But I I'm. But I almost kind of do. But anyway. Yeah. It's it's. Yeah. 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 Like uh. Yeah. Summer Running Week says Jeff Bezos is at least understandable, like Lex Luthor. Bingo. Yeah. This is great. Yeah, so, I get it. <laughs> you know, whereas like whereas like Zuckerberg or or Musk are kind of like um did you ever see Glass Onion, the 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 knives yep. out sequel? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So like the Edward Norton character in that movie, who turns yeah. out is completely full of shit, has completely no idea what he's doing, he's a moron. Yeah. Um, like that's I think that's really what these guys are. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them. I think For they're sure. just kind of hucksters. Um uh but anyway, yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, I think if so, getting back to the book, I mean, I think that, you know, continuing the path of economic growth is not where it's at. It, yeah. This is not going to be the future for us. But what is? And I, and so he sort of lays out what he says are sort of key elements of what he would think of as a degrowth agenda. Okay. One of the first ones is one that I'm very big about, I've talked about, is stopped, stopping planned obsolescence. Yeah. This is a key element. So yeah. capitalism is predicated on planned obsolescence. You got to have the new phone, you got to have the new washer dryer, you got to have the new car, whatever it is, right? Because it's constantly predicated on growth. We live in a world now where, you know, 100 years ago, let's say you bought a car, um, or even 50 years ago, if you bought a car, like if something went wrong with it, you could like take it in, get a part replaced and go home. Yeah. It was not yeah. that elaborate. We live in a world now where you can't just do that. Um, and it's same with the computers. Apple is a very good example of a company that really loves planned obsolescence. Right. Um, because they're a hardware firm, right? Like Apple is fundamentally, it fundamentally sells hardware. It does have software, but it gives the software for free because you right. bought the hardware. And it's predicated on you buying the hardware or buying new versions of the hardware every 16, 18 months, depending on whenever your phone plan shows up. 
Yeah. So it's prohibitively expensive to fix these things. It's very hard. I have a firsthand account of this myself in relation to Apple. So I'm streaming tonight through my iMac, um, which is a, which we, my wife and I think we bought in 2015. It's a 2013 model. When I took it into the Apple store, they described it as a vintage model, which I thought was very funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I had a power outage and uh, my hard drive got fried and it destroyed my computer. It turned it into a brick. And uh, the person in the store was like, well, I can't fix this for you. We don't have the parts to do it, but you can do this yourself. Um, and I did it myself. So I took it home. Um, basically, the screen, the computer and the monitor, are all one thing with a Mac system. Yeah. But in order to get into it, I had to take the screen off. Because you have to take the screen off to get to the to, to the hardware. In order to do that, because the the screen is is put on with stickers, <laughs> just elaborate stickers that are kind of made out of foam. And so this kit that I bought, which was like a hundred bucks, comes with like a little pizza cutter. And you go around the edge of the computer, and you cut up the stickers, and then you pop off the screen. That's the really hard part. The, the changing of the drive is actually fairly easy. It's a couple of screws. You pop it in, you pop it out, you're done. Right. And then it comes with these very elaborate, very specifically designed stickers that you put all back around and then you pop the screen back on. And you have to do all this while everything's hooked back in. So it's not easy, but it's not like the hardest thing on the planet. Right. Um, and I got my computer back, you know, because it was just going to be a computer that was going to be junked. I couldn't have done anything with it. But it was worth the shot to try to fix it. For and sure. so we're living in an age now where people are, I think, doing that more with uh, with YouTube and WikiHow and others where people are like, how can I fix this myself? Um, because they bank on you every seven, 10 years buying a new wash and dryer. Yep. They bank on you every 16 months buying a new phone that you buy a pair of pantyhose, as he describes in the book. Um and they wear out after a couple of wears, right? Yeah. Fast fashion is a huge component of this, where people yeah. will buy, uh, and Shein is a good example of this, um, where a lot of Shein clothing is made out of literal plastic. Yeah. So people will wear it. It's crappy. It's uncomfortable. It's gross. They'll wear it maybe one or two times. It ends up in a landfill, and it never biodegrades because it's not yeah. made out of cotton. Yeah. I, so was that's just, the, uh, yeah. I was just doing laundry the other day, and every single thing from Sheen says, wash, hand wash cold, hang to dry. So if, yeah. you, if you do any machine work with it, it will break down. Like as if it doesn't, you know, it'll just start ripping and falling apart. And it's not like your typical fabrics, like made out of wood, out of cotton or linen or wool or silk or whatever, where if they break down, they go in your filter, you can get them out. It's not like that. It's plastic. Yeah. It melts. Like, you you know, it doesn't tear, it melts. So, like, that's kind of the other problem, too. Um, and that really goes into um, what are some of the, the ways we can stop plan obsolescence? One is extended warranties. He talks about how Apple could do a 10-year warranty for their products. Um, and if they did that, there would be more of an incentive for them to fix them rather than to have to buy new ones because it would yeah. cost the company more. Um, right to repair laws. I'm very big about right to repair laws. We're living in a world now where it's harder and harder for you to go to like a local mechanic and get your car fixed, to go into a little local shop and have your um, phone fixed. It's much tougher because they don't want you to do that. They just yeah. want you to buy something new. Yeah. And people will say, oh, you know, this generation, they're just so throwaway. They don't keep, they don't take care of things. We actually do. They're just crappier yeah. than what people had 50 or 100 years ago. You know, now, mind you, I'm not going to like give you some story here about how everything was better 50 years ago. You know, 50 years ago, there was still stuff with asbestos and lead paint. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, right. there, there was stuff back then that was pretty bad for you too. And bad for the environment. Charcoal briquettes. <laughs> Charcoal briquettes, right? <laughs> Leaded gasoline. Leaded lead in gasoline. paint. Yeah. Lead in general, you know, asbestos, yeah. right? So like, there are things that are really dangerous. Um, but, uh, but. One, but yeah, so, and then I will take this even further. I've had this idea for years. I've talked about it ad nauseum, which is I call it the Federal Bureau of Repairs and Replacements. I wish we lived in like a social society where you could go into a state run organization or a community run organization and they would fix your stuff yeah. for either free or for a nominal fee. For 20 bucks, we'll fix your iPhone. For 30 bucks, we'll fix your, you, you know, we'll fix your MacBook. Yeah. For 10 bucks, we'll fix your toaster. Like those kinds of things, right? 
this is part of the problem of when we have planned obsolescence, people just buy new stuff instead of instead of using the things that they have. Yeah. Which is terrible for the environment. The other thing he talks about is cutting advertising, mm-hmm. which I agree with. Yeah. Americans ban it all. Mean, <laughs> just ban it all, right? <laughs> now, uh, yeah, it, it's like, wouldn't it be wonderful if like instead of billboards constantly hawking shit you didn't need, it was just public art? Yep. Wouldn't that be nice? That'd be wonderful. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? It would just be kind of be lovely. Like community art that you see. Um, and it's really sad that most of the community art in my, in my city is done on the sides of Jiffy Lubes, um, which is depressing, but it is what it is, unfortunately, at this time. Um, so stop wasting resources on hawking stuff people don't need. So fast fashion's a big culprit here. He kind of calls out fast fashion by name. We've been talking about it. Yeah. Fast fashion's terrible, right? People did not have as many clothes as people do now. Right. <laughs> Most people would not own that much. People often had, men often had, 100 years ago, often had one good suit. And it was the suit that they were married in. And it was often the suit they were buried in. Yeah. And that was often the case, right? Women often had very few clothes. I'm reading a book on the Wright brothers right now, the inventors of the airplane. And when Wilbur Wright went to Europe in, I think, 1907, 1908, uh, he only carried like one bag with him and that was like a briefcase because he was wearing all the clothes he brought with him and so when he got there he's like i'm gonna buy two new suits so he bought a business suit and a tuxedo and that was like a big deal yeah to buy two suits cut to today where people are buying clothes at incredible rates yeah stuff that they may only wear a couple times it gets a hole in it instead of sewing that hole they throw it away right yep yep that's disastrous for the that's disastrous for the environment yeah um and, it's great and for capitalism. It's great for <laughs> capitalism, right? Because here's the thing, right? When you donate stuff to like a Goodwill or a Salvation Army or some kind of charity shop, a lot of that shit does never ends up on the sh- shop floor. Yeah. Or if it does, it ends up getting surplused out, and a lot of it either gets donated to people just to wear, or it gets landfilled. This is why you're, you'll hear stories of like um, Target instead of like. Um, donating clothes that they have left over from like a season they'll you know or gap or whatever they'll literally take box cutters to it so that no one will wear it because it has to create that artificial scarcity this is insanity yeah this is insanity i can't stress that enough the other component he says that we need to do is we need to shift from ownership to usership i think some of this is good he talks about public transport instead of cars yep i'm big about this he had an idea that I think is good in practice, but if it was done in, in good in theory, but done in practice might be shipped, which is like an app that people can use to coordinate people borrowing like a, like a lawnmower or like a leaf blower or something. I think that's a decent idea. And I think in a healthy society that might work, uh, but <laughs> I don't know. In our current society, maybe not so much. <laughs> I'm very, very skeptical of anybody who says, well, we'll create an app for that. Yeah, yeah, because the people who have been creating apps for things are like Uber, which is like destroying union jobs for transportation, Grubhub and DoorDash, which are, again, really disastrous for the people who work them. You know that firsthand from yeah. how awful it is. Yeah. Um, uh, and and then you have like Lyft and all these other companies. Their goal is to undermine industries. And undermine the labor protections of said industries. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in theory, like in a degrowth society, yeah, I think like an app where it's like, hey, can I borrow, can we borrow the community thing today? Yeah. And there is a good example of this. Like there is a real world example of what he's describing that is good, which is public libraries. Right. Yeah. Public libraries do yeah. this. Yeah. So like there are public libraries that don't just lend out books. They lend out things like if you want to borrow um, if you want to borrow a leaf blower, sometimes they have one of those. If, if they, if you want to borrow a saw, they may have that. Yeah. If you want to, um, uh, if you want to have seeds for your garden, like you can go in and like borrow gardening stuff or they will give you seeds for free. The That's guys, all wonderful stuff. The yeah. guys from, uh, seriously wrong podcast. They mm-hmm. talk about library socialism or use all the time. So awesome. like, yeah, like it's, uh, it's like they're, they have a, a pretty in-depth theory of library socialism and a library of things like that. Like, I love that. I think that uh, I've never thought of the words library socialism together in my life, which is crazy considering how much I love socialism and how much I love books. But, <laughs> um, 
library socialism is awesome. I, it's exactly, yeah, but it's like, and public institutions. And that's the other thing too, that he says is like, um, uh, improve, you know, uh, he talks about how one of the things is decommodifying, decommodify goods and expand the commons. And that includes like healthcare, housing, transportation, education. Yeah. Also includes things like the internet, as he mentions, public libraries, as we've talked about, parks. The problem is, is that we have seen a, a nearly half century long assault on the commons around the world um, with the yeah. advent of neoliberalism. I think this is a really great time to advocate for, you know, forms of library socialism or healthcare socialism, housing socialism, um, maybe starting at the municipal level in some ways with your public library programs and making our way up to broader, larger social changes. Yeah. Um, I'm very much in favor of that. I think that's a good thing. Um, scaling down ecologically destructive industries. So he talks about like you know, things like fossil fuel, logging, the beef industry, private jets, McMansions. That's um, just shit that just has to happen. It has to happen. We talked about in the pregame about beef. Yeah. That beef accounts like the, the cultivation of beef accounts for 60% of all agricultural land use in the world, but it only accounts for 2% of global food consumption. Yeah. So we're using 60% of land to create 2% of the food. It's absurd. Uh, I'm very okay with giving up my hamburger. I know that there are some fascists uh, and morons <laughs> like Seb Gorka who don't want to give up their hamburger. I'm very okay with it. Um, if they could figure out science, Scientists, anybody watching, yeah. let's come up with a beef alternative that may be made of soy. Whatever. That is okay for the people <laughs> who are allergic to soy to eat it. Yeah. Because I'm allergic to soy. Oh, no. I can't eat soy. So I have to eat. I often have to eat animals as my form of protein because soy make, messes me up. Yeah. Let's work on that, guys. Get, get your noggins on that. Anyway. Um, we talked about ending food waste. Fifty percent of all food in the country in the world is 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 wasted every year. A lot of food is not put to market because of cosmetic defects. Yeah. So like, oh, this apple doesn't look quite nice, or this other thing doesn't look quite nice. Whatever. That should be done away with. We talked about South Korea banning food waste from landfills. Um, we would also work on on decreasing global inequality and decolonization efforts, right? We would, we would give power back to the global South. The global North would no longer pursue its, 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 um, its constant barrage of colonialism and, and resource extraction. Yeah. Um, there'd be a f more fair and equitable um, balance of power between the global South and the global North. One of the ways, some of the policies that we get there may be something like a maximum wage. If there's a minimum wage, why isn't there a maximum? What's the limit, right? And he says, like, what's the limit of people because as, as some studies have shown that he cites in the book, um, you know, after a certain income threshold, people aren't happier. Right. Like they just aren't. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and part of the reason that people are constantly needing more and more income is to pay for things that should be common goods anyway they're paid for by taxes, like healthcare, education, housing, and so forth. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are wasting all of their resources and having to work a lot more in order to pay for things that should just be held in common yep. in a public and public way. Global wealth tax. This is something that um, economists like uh, Manuel Says and Gabriel Zuckman and Thomas Piketty have argued. It was a global wealth tax um, and a 10 percent annual marginal tax on wealth holdings over one billion dollars. Um, this uh, in the book, he says this would push the richest to sell some of their assets, thus distribute, distributing wealth more fairly. I think all those are great things. I would also just say there are certain things that can be done on a national level that can really improve inequality, can lessen inequality. One of them has to do, in, in the United States at least, one of them has to do with Social Security. Mm. So in the United States, I think the number is like $144,000. Um, where after that number, if you've made more than that, you no longer have to pay social security taxes. Whatever money you make after a certain income threshold, which right. is basically a low six figures, you don't pay any taxes on that. So billionaires and millionaires basically pay the same amount in social security yeah, they as, it out. as yeah. a modest middle-class family would, right? Yeah. Um, on a six-figure income, which sounds like that. it's a lot of money. Yeah, we have that too, where like EI and uh, CPP, you max it out. So once yeah. you've paid a certain amount every year, then you uh, you don't pay into it anymore. And one of the ways that we can lower inequality is killing the cap. 
Yeah. It's a very simple way to do it, which is just to kill the cap where all income is taxed for social security or all, or for the programs in Canada, you would just kill the cap. Yeah. And because people are always like, oh my God, social security is going bankrupt. No, it's not. It's not. (laughs) Social security is not going bankrupt. It's its own separate trust trust fund. It's paid for with its own specific form of payroll taxes. It's not in the discretionary budget. Like it's its own thing. Um, that often the, the U S government will raid for other crap, even though they shouldn't. Yeah. Social security could be very solvent and, and go well into generations if you killed the income cap. Yeah. That's the way to do it. So that's one thing, you know, it, and debt cancellation is another thing, right? We have all these people, student debt, medical debt. A lot of, a, lot, a large majority of bankruptcies in America are because of medical debt. They're not because people went out and bought too many coffees and avocado toasts. Of course it's not. It's because yeah. <laughs> people got cancer or they, or they got hit yeah. by a bus yeah. or, you know, they, uh, they realized that they had you know, diabetes or something. Like it's often medical debt. You know, I have medical debt. It sucks. <laughs> I don't have a lot, but I do have some. Yeah, and I've been yeah. working for years to pay it off. Um, monetary policy. We could get rid of debt-based currency regulated by banks and create a public-based currency system separated from the debt imperative. Yeah. We can institute a steady state economy too, yeah. where you know never extracting more than ecosystems can regenerate and never wasting or polluting more than ecosystems can safely absorb. Um he never he doesn't say this explicitly in the book, but one way we get public banking is postal banking. You could do your your banking through the post office. In the United States, from around the creation of the Federal Reserve, which is like 1913, 1914, up to about 1960s, early 1960s, the United States had public banking where you could go into and you could have your checking account, your savings account at the bank. And we don't have that anymore. We have private banking. Um, private banking sucks. They, they basically create money out of thin air. It's called fractional reserve banking. Um, and it's all backed up by debt. And this is disastrous for the economy because when people cannot pay back their loans, it's a vicious cycle that takes down a lot of the economy with it, yeah. like the subprime mortgage crisis in 2008. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So those are all huge problems. The, and so to finish up, he kind of brings it back full circle. I mentioned at the beginning, that he had done research um, with, uh, with migrant workers in South Africa. And he's also done some research uh, involving like indigenous communities. Okay. I think that's a good way to sort of maybe finish up our discussion tonight on this book, which is that we need to learn from indigenous communities too. There is no one way of getting us to a future that is prosperous and eco- economically viable and environmentally viable for all. Um, we need to get back to the concept of animism. We need to re- recognize that humans are not this thing that sits above everything else. Yeah. That's separate. That we're actually interrelated and connected. So instead of, th- instead of going, instead of going with Descartes, we should go with another philosopher who rejected Descartes and sort of argued for something else. And that's Spinoza. Mm-hmm. Baruch Spinoza, the, you know, the great philosopher who argued that, um, the, that everything is an interconnected whole and that we are about a part of that interconnected whole and how everything is interrelated and together. This is something that I think is very crucial for us to get to a better future is recognizing that everything is interconnected and interrelated and that if you do something over here, it's going to affect this over there. Yeah. We, in capitalism, we often just sort of, eh, I'm not going to think about that. We call it an externality and we move on. Right. No. A healthy system and a healthy world would always calculate all of these things in. Yeah. So, you know, to kind of sum up, I mean, I think this book is great. I think it's probably the most eloquent and and not just practical vision for how we get to a better world, but also moral argument for how do we get to a better world. Um, and my sort of final takeaways are that um, that I think degrowth is a viable viewpoint. I think it's one that we need to learn from. I think it's, I think that there's an argument to be made that why are we making all of this stuff? Why are we consuming all of this stuff? Why do people have private jets? Why do people have huge houses? Why do people have all this crap they don't need? Why are we constantly hoarding wealth? You know, and, and, and again, it's not people like you or me, right? Because one of the arguments against degrowth is like, oh, well, it's selling austerity to people who've already had it bad the last four decades. It's like, no, you know, it's not selling austerity. 
to yeah. the working class. It's selling austerity to the capitalist class. Yeah. It's saying that you guys don't get to have it all anymore, that you just don't get to hoard wealth and power. Because yeah. if you do so, you're going to kill the planet and you're going to kill democracy at the same time. And then if you do both of those things, then you won't have any people to sell anything to anymore. Yeah. And so uh, I also think that a degrowth world would not have stupid crap like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and all of this, um, because I think people don't realize how much environmental resources yeah. it and, and destruction that it requires to have all of this. All those calculations being done by all those servers and whatnot for Bitcoin, mm -hmm. like it's just wild. How and much? it's the same for all this AI stuff that they're passing off now. It's all yeah. these server farms that are not good for the environment either. It's not solving any problems. No. We, are in a, we live in a society that is predicated on does it generate profit rather than and growth rather than does this solve a problem? Right. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and the thing is, is I think he has a great tweet that he put out once where Jason Hickel said something along the lines of like, if this system is destroying the environment and it's not making people's basic needs, then what's the point? Which I think <laughs> yeah, is true. Right. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. and so. Then what the fuck yeah, are we actually doing? What, what's the point of all of this? Because that's the thing, right? Is we've lived in a world where political economy, right? used to be called moral philosophy, right? It's, it's right. The, you know, it's, that's what it was called in the back in the day. And then it became political economy. Politics and morals were always a component of understanding the economy. When we took away those components and made it just economics, yep. that's really the problem, where you're taking out the political concerns, the economic concerns, and the real human concerns. Because why does an economy exist? It should exist, ideally, to satisfy people's needs and to uh, and help us negotiate yeah. scarce resources or just resources in general for a better mode of human flourishing. Like, that should be the goal. Yeah. But, but it's not. And that's because the growthism is the sort of albatross that hangs over us all the time. Um, yeah. and we should kill it. I mean, you know, in order for the, the planet to thrive, for humanity to thrive, this concept of growth has to go. Yep. Yeah, um, sure. and so I'm, I'm enthusiastically co-signing on that. Um, and so we don't have to, we don't have to sacrifice a good standard of living. We do not have to sacrifice, um, uh, our autonomy. We don't have to sacrifice, um, our needs. Yeah. Well, we can just build a better world without all this unnecessary stuff that we waste our time on. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's less is more. I highly recommend yeah. people read it. Um, it's an excellent book. Um, and, uh, and, uh, it's been a, a real journey for me to kind of embrace a lot of what the degrowth movement has to say, because I think a lot of it's right. Right on. Um, I guess that leaves us with what are we covering next time? Next time, um, we are going back to, uh, the well, as it were. Um, and we are going to, um, talk about another component of Lenin. So, our, one of our followers who watches our stuff, Kerrigan, asked us to do a couple of books on Lenin this year. So the first one we did earlier in the spring, we talked about sort of the political, um, the political ideology of Lenin. This time we're going to kind of talk about the Lenin as a political philosopher. Ah. Um, and so it's uh, Lenin as philosopher by Anton Panacek. This will be part two of our three part series on Anton Panacek this year. Nice. Um, our episode um, on Marxism and Darwinism, I think dropped this week. Yep. Um, so that's part one. This will be part two in our Anton Panacek speaker and Anton Panacek series. Um, so that's what we'll be doing next time. Cool. And I guess uh, we also have a, our live stream is tomorrow night for our hitting 1000 subscribers. So, if you want to join us for that, that'd be great. I don't, yes. I don't know quite what we're doing yet, but we're going to come we're on and kind of, hang out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> come on, hang out. Drop us questions. Think of it as like an office hours. We'll we'll try to cover a variety of topics, um, you yeah. know, uh, and that'll, I think that'll be really, really fun. So I'm excited about doing that tomorrow. For sure. And I guess that just leaves. Where can people find you? You can find me at justinclark.org. Websites are right down there. 
Um, that's where you can find all of my writings and you can find the podcast. Every episode's available there. Um, and I'm currently working on a couple of um, articles for my regular work at the Indiana Historical Bureau. Um, one about the, um, ironically enough, one about the Studebaker electric car from like uh, 1900 nice. or whatever, 1902, 1904. Um, and, uh, and I'm also working on one about a physician, um, a small town musician, uh, physician and Ferdinand, who was a Jew Jewish immigrant who, um, employed, he was also the postmaster of Ferdinand and he employed as his assistant postmaster in 19, I think 1904 or 1907, um, an African American girl. Um, and so he was kind of bold and forward thinking of his time and an interesting guy. Um, so I'm going to, those are kind of the things I'm working on. Cool. Um, and so, yeah. And then you can follow me on social media. I'm at Justin Clark PH PH stands for public history. Um, I'm on um, Instagram. I'm on threads, TikTok, blue sky. I'm mostly active on Instagram though. Although I'm trying to be more on TikTok and, and threads, but honestly, I'm just mostly on Instagram. Um, and as always, Please consider becoming a patron. Patron, uh, patreon.com, uh, the skeptical leftist. Um, we would highly appreciate your support. Corey does a lot of hard work, puts a lot of resources into making this show possible. Um, and, uh, and he is killing it in terms of the kill, creating the clips for us. And, and we've got the new logos here and, and, and everything's looking really, really great. We really appreciate all the support. Sure. Um, and so please consider becoming a patron. Um, and, uh, and I, I hope you will. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you, Justin. And thank you to everybody who was in the chat and who was watching or listening, uh, without commenting. That's fine. I, I appreciate everybody around and Absolutely. Uh, have a great night. Thanks everybody. All right, folks. That's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie Athope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron, and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I would like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. say it is in the united states we have a sort of center-right party and that's the democrats yeah. and then we have like a far-right fascist party and that's the republicans yeah. and there is no left party no there just isn't one there they, they exist right so there's like dsa or psl or the greens or whatever but like they don't really hold power they don't yeah, other they than can't get on the ballot really so they can't get really on the ballot and they're only elected in certain places like it's just not you know yeah. what i mean it's not really a thing so and it's precisely because the one thing that the two parties can always agree on is more money for war, tax cuts for rich assholes, and the maintaining of the two-party system.